right, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Testing. Okay. Well, before we start the taping, why don't we all just welcome Roy Blunt, Jr. Oh, thank you. And he's joined by his, with, by his lovely, how do you say that? By, this man, I'm so <laughs> scared of how I use words now, yeah. having read this book. <laughs> Your lovely wife is joining you this yeah. evening, right? Right, she's with us also. Yeah. All right, so we're about ready to get started. As you know, this is going to be taped as a regular show, so I'll be basically doing it the way I do my show, and sometimes I have to do do-overs. I have to ask the question again or whatever, which will be edited out, but um, you'll have to, unfortunately, uh, bear witness to it tonight. Um, any questions before we get started? Not from the audience, but from my tech people and my producer. Are we okay? <laughs> Your questions come later. Okay, great. All right, here we go. Good evening. I'm Valerie Jackson, and welcome to a very special edition of Between the Lines. Today we're coming to you from the Literary Center at the Margaret Mitchell House in Atlanta, where I'm going between the lines with award-winning humorist, lecturer, author, and poet, and sports writer, and so many other things, Roy Blunt, Jr. The few of you who haven't yet read any of his previous award-winning books may have heard him, however, on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which is a very funny news quiz show where he offers both serious and humorous commentaries on everything from Southern culture to Sarah Palin. <laughs> With 21 books under his belt, he's one of America's most prolific authors, and his latest book, Alphabet Juice, is an amazing study of the origin and use of some of our well-known and not-so-well-known words and phrases. He's a usage consultant to the American Heritage Dictionary and an amazing wordsmith. So believe me when I say I've agonized over practically every word that I'm using tonight. Hopefully, its usage is correct. So without further ado, welcome to the Margaret Mitchell House, Roy, and thank you for allowing us to go between the lines with you today. Thank you, Valerie. It's good to see you again. Well, your pleasure in working with words is evident in the all-inclusive subtitle <laughs> of your book. And I'll just read that. It's the Alphabet Juice. The energies, gist, and spirits of letters, words, and combinations thereof. Their roots, bones, innards, pits, pits, and secret parts, tinctures, tonics, and essences, <laughs> with examples of their usage, foul, and savory. <laughs> well, I'm not sure of what all that means, but it sure sounded good, right? <laughs> and Michael Durda of the Washington Post said that you don't so much read alphabet juice as you listen to it. There are scholars, however, Roy, that think the association between a word and its meaning is just simply arbitrary. Let's hear your theory on the idea. My theory is that uh, that's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, that's sort of the theme of this book. Uh, mainly it's an excuse just to tell stories about words that I like and one thing or another. But uh, I, I am put off by that notion, that, uh, which is uh, sort of a basic tenet of linguistics, apparently, that uh, the relation between a word and its meaning is arbitrary. Um, and um, Steven Pinker cites as evidence for that pig noise. He says, for instance, uh, in... Um, in English, pigs go oink, oink. And in, is anybody from Norway here? No. In Nor, you are? No, I thought you raised your hand. Excuse me. In Nor, I was just going to ask if I was pronouncing this right. In Norwegian, pigs go nuff, nuff, apparently. <laughs> and in um, Russian, pigs go, Stephen Pinker writes, C-H-R-J-O, C-H-R-J-O. Which, I mean, who knows what that looks like in Russian or sound like that. Right? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I look, you know, I, so I Googled Russian pigs go. And uh, 
there's you try it at home. Sure enough, uh, somebody on the internet was uh, able to tell tell me that. Um, in fact, in fact, Russian pigs go H R O O H R O O, but the H is sort of like a K H. But don't pronounce the K; just flim up the H. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't sound arbitrary to me. That sounds like you know those to me sound like three different pig noises. And, then, uh, um, and I don't see it. people have gone you know over the centuries. People have worked hard to come up. Try to spell pig noise and various pig noises and just throw all that out the window is crazy to me. But, you know, there's a phrase in the book, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Is it kinesthetically? Kinesthetically, ki yeah. Kin kinesthetically, let right. me say that again. Kinesthetically evocative. Right, yeah. Well, what but, do you mean by that? I mean, um, you know, li linguists will say, okay, there are some obviously onomatopoeic words like... Uh, Snap, crackle, pop, things like that. Uh, but, you know, they're kind of insignificant. Uh, but in fact, I noticed that there are lots of words that, uh, there are lots of words whose sound evokes uh, the meaning, but there are also words whose, who evoke the, their meaning by how they move through your mouth. For instance, the word through starts out at the front of your mouth and goes right straight back, it's like a, you know, a shotgun house where you shoot straight through, it goes through all the room. Um, only with the back door closed because that last H sort of comes back at you, a little puff. <laughs> a little puff. Whereas the word thwart doesn't go straight through. It starts out thin, and then your W jumps out and, and stops you. You know, it's, it, it sort of make, it acts out thwarting. And throttle starts out like through, but it gets in the back of your throat. Throttle back into the, in, it's like you're being throttled. Um, um, and in fact, it's back in your glottis, which is, uh, when people say, oh, no, you didn't, or uh, uh-oh, or I'm getting married in the morning, that's a glottal stop. And, uh, and if you get throttled, your glottal will stop. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what about ka-ching? Ka-ching is a good one, yeah. You know, a lot of things, I noticed, let me see, I had a whole list of ch words that are really catchy. There's ka-ching, there's uh, gotcha. Uh, you know, we, we don't do, uh, I don't answer gotcha questions. It's a great defense against any question. Uh, and then there's uh, somebody is making, doing a, a tour called uh, Rock With You, W-I-C-H-U, With You. Mm. Um, and there's several, and ka-ching, and I think there's several other ch words lately that have been sort of going around. And people like to say ch, you know. <laughs> it's, 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 a lot of words are popular because people like to say them. Words like stuff. Stuff has all kinds of different meanings. Because it's fun to say. It, 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 I, I, you had about, what, 15 or 20 meanings of, of stuff? stuff? Yeah, you know, we can all think of it. You know, on the one hand, it means just uh, messy, uh, you know, uh, in, in this, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, at any rate, just sort of uh, miscellaneous uh, stuff around the house. On the other hand, uh, she, you know, you talk about the right stuff, or, you know, that's, that's yeah. the real stuff there. Or you talk about stuffing of a uh, turkey and you know, one thing and another. Bust also has lots of different meanings. So, so when we talk about words like, I mentioned ka-ching earlier, there's, a, there's a, a word in your book that you use often, sonicky? Yeah. So, uh, sonicky is something I made up just to uh, describe um, words that not only that, that have either sound or kinesthetic uh, catchiness that, that relate to the meaning, words mm -hmm. like through and words like rickety and words like uh, prestidigitation and words like uh, squeezy. And, uh, you know, if, if a cave person who had never had any, any verbal tra tradition behind him at all, or her, uh, might well have come up in feeling a certain way with, with the sound of nausea. That word sounds like it ought to sound, and that to me is, is, is sonic -y. I just thought of some more chill words, cha-cha. <laughs> well, I share your fondness for, for thumbing through dictionaries. I mean, I'll, I'll sit mm. one Sunday afternoon and just read the dictionary, uh, as I found out you did too, or do also. Um, this work, Alphabet Juice, is laid out in an A to Z dictionary format which means that you can really go to any letter and start 
reading, but I, I would really recommend reading it from the beginning to the end because I like the fact that later in later chapters you refer back to words you've already explained earlier, and it really mm. makes it a yeah. lot more meaningful. Um, I thought of another chat. What? <laughs> what is that? Chattahoochee. <laughs> And Chattanooga Choo Choo. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's lots of cross referencing. And, uh, I expect lots of people will just sort of get lost going back and forth and, and never know whether they have finished it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's take a look at some of the words you've included in Alphabet Juice. By the way, wh why the title Alphabet Juice? Well, it's because it seems to me there are inherent, uh, there is inherent value in letters and their sounds. And, uh, you know, there's energy in there, and, you, and it, oh, okay. works, it works toward meaning. And, uh, you know, things like, you, you know, juice like uh, electricity, like oh, know, yes. liquor, like uh, you see every now and then you see a woman walking down the street and uh, in kind of a low-cut, um, you know, <laughs> pants, and uh, it says juicy across the back. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, have that sort of thing in mind. Okay, so we're talking about alphabet energy, really. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, right, yeah. <laughs> so the word, the word from the A chapter that I want to talk about is the use of the word arguably. Mm. Yeah. Why do we have often trouble with this word? Well, p people, you never know whether people mean, you could say arguably Margaret Mitchell was the you know, greatest Civil War novelist, but, and, but inarguably she was, uh, you know, wrote the, wrote the novel that uh, made the greatest Civil War movie. Now, you're using it two different ways that way. You're saying arguably, I think that means you can argue that. It's like, a dis, you know, but inarguably, you're saying you can't argue that. You know what I mean? You, it, what, what that person means is arguably she, was, she wrote the Great Civil War novel, and indisputably she wrote the uh, novel that made the Great Civil War movie. You know what I mean? So people use arguably to mean um, disputable and also to mean uh, uh, that you can argue it. So it, it gets confusing. As I was. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was immediately drawn to the word book under, ah, yeah. under B, um, being a book lover. Mm -hmm. But I was totally shocked at the definition from UrbanDictionary.com, which I have yet to visit. I'm not sure if I want to. Yeah. But uh, it, let's talk about the definition. It's on, I don't know if you want to read it or if you remember it. It's page 40. Yeah, okay, um, all right, I'll do it. Yeah, UrbanDictionary.com, if you have children who use expressions that you don't understand and you're sure you want to understand them, you can go on UrbanDictionary.com and you'll probably here you go. find them. I got here. Uh, the number one definition of this term of the word book was, quote, an object used as a coaster to increase the height of small children or to increase the stability of poorly built furniture. Example, where do you want me to put your drink? Uh, oh, just leave it on top of that book. That's a, <laughs> you know. That, that, it hurt me so I know. It hurt me when I heard that. That could make me mad, but I decided just to go with it. You know. <laughs> well, I prefer Franz Kafka uh, at the end when he oh, said, yeah, that, too. said uh, his line at the end. A book ought to be an ice pick, or if you translate it differently, an axe. Ice pick or axe to break up the frozen sea within us. I prefer that one. Yeah. Okay. All right. E. We're not going to take every alphabet. <laughs> you know, we'd be here for uh, hours. But E is the most frequent letter in English. Yeah. Why is that? Do you know why? Well, I, I don't know. It makes several different sounds. It's you know, long E and, and soft E. It's also at the end of V, which is one of the most common words. And it's just a handy vowel, I guess. I'm not sure. But also, it's often there are two. It takes two E's to make a long. E sound, like in three, or, or peak, peekaboo. Um, so what with one thing or another? A lot of it may be the fact that it's the last letter in V. V is an interesting word because on, our, oops, on UrbanDictionary.com, you will find the word whoop, whoop. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, let's let that fight. I know it, yeah, you know it, to take me away. Um, you want me to start, where should I start yeah, over we're just, at? Um, we're just talking about V, you were v, yeah. v. v is uh, an interesting word. It, if you, because I mean, a lot people often mistype V as T E H. I notice I do it a lot. Uh, it may must have something to do with your your left 
right hand can't jump in between the two left hand letters or something. But um, well, anyway, I can never tell. If I look at my fingers, I can't tell what letters they hit. Isn't that funny? But if but I'm typing, I know it anyway. Um, but um, T E H. So you often type T E H instead of T H E, and it apparently happens so often in texting that uh, T E H has taken on a meaning of its own. It really? means sort of like, you know, this is uh, th that was the if you, you say the Civil War novel, like it's an intensive uh, the, you know, like uh, L L Civil War novel or something. You know, <laughs> so so you say T. Test Civil War novel, and it's gotten so common that on UrbanDictionary.com, if you look up the word "the," the number one de definition is the most common misspelling of the word "te." You also mentioned that babies are uh, the infant, the first sound of infants. Oh, so that's right. So I read, read that, that the first vowel sound inf infants make is E. <laughs> I, <laughs> okay, next so time I see an infant who hadn't made a sound yet, I will uh, I'll check, <laughs> check that it out. out. Yeah. Right, right. So is it either or is it either? I say either. You say, uh, you know, that, <laughs> there's that famous uh, joke. A uh, yeah. uh, woman came in to audition for... Uh, um, uh, for a part, in the, and so she sang, uh, uh, you say tomato, and I say tomato, you say potato, and I say potato, yeah. tomato, tomato, potato, potato, let's call the whole thing off. And, uh, and, uh, and they said, um, okay, we'll call you Ms. Goldstein, and she said, Goldstein. <laughs> Okay, uh, the, the final E, etymology. What, why and how does a knowledge of roots help us in today's language? Well, I, it just, uh, I think the better you know a word, the more you can, best, better you use it. And the more you know about its history and where it came from and the sounds of it, uh, the more you can enjoy using it, too. I love, there's a, a uh, whole section in the back of the American Heritage Dictionary called uh, Proto-Indo-European Roots. Um, and when you look up a word like, let's see, well, a word like, uh, uh, I'll look it up here in the book. Um, you go to, uh, say you're, excuse me, looking up, uh, I'm, I've got to watch my, uh, Shelby Foote said he didn't go on TV because he didn't have any of those long socks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> my, my father was a great man, but he wore the shortest socks. I mean, you know? Um you look up a word like um, uh, vogue, say, and it, the American Heritage Dictionary will refer you, after giving the definition, will refer you to uh, the roots uh, uh, appendix, and it will say um, C. Wegg, W-E-G-H. And you'll find there that Wegg, from Wegg we get not only vogue, but also weight, as in W-E-I-G-H-T, and wiggle, and way, and earwig. And um, it's, I just love going back and finding all these bizarre families of, of words that have come. But how we get, what, you know, proto European I'm sorry, P-I, I've been doing, I've been traveling. P-I-E comes from um, the uh, realization of a uh, judge, British judge in India in 1780 named Sir William Jones. He, it struck him in India that the that words in Sanskrit Greek and Latin were all so similar that they must have come from some common previous language that was not only dead, but it left no traces except all the other languages that it gave birth to. So now people have pieced together, figured out this whole rootsy, uh, whole system of roots from which various, uh, and one third of the world's peoples, peoples speak uh, languages uh, that derive from Proto-Indo-European. It's uh, and I just love going back there in the back, and uh, you just hear all these wag and grug and grrr, and just like language is groaning to be born. Oh, okay. Uh, groaning to be born. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Geoffrey Torrey, I believe it was, said that H 
is not a letter. Yeah, well, it so, shouldn't be because it's it's so often silent. What do you yeah, think about right, that? Yeah, right, yeah. There was a guy named Jeffrey Torrey, back, I've forgotten what century he flourished in, but he had all these theories about letters. And he was down on H. Um, <laughs> but uh, it seems to me that one of the son that H is a really sonic -y letter. You'll notice how many um, words involving heavy effort start with H, like heave and ho, heave ho, and, oh. uh, and heft and uh, heavy and, uh, and um, hurl and uh, all sorts. And, you know, it's, it's the sound you make when you're driving a stake in the railroad. Huh, you know. And, it, and I've got a whole long list in here of all the effortful words, uh, you know, hit, I don't know, lots and lots of words like that that start with H. And, uh, and it's that, huh, that breath, uh, that bound, I don't think that's coincidental. I think words derive in part from their connection to... From that physicality yeah, yeah, of, right. of, of the pronunciation right. and so forth. Well, uh, according to OED, Oxford um, English Dictionary, the power of H is that of a simple aspiration of breathing, yeah. which is huh. basically yeah, right. what you just said. Yeah. So why do so many reduplicative, and I got that from the book, yeah. reduplicative expressions start with H? For instance, hanky panky, right. hocus pocus, handy dandy. What? What? You know, higgledy piggledy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, hunky dory. I don't know, uh, but I noticed that there. But I went through the dictionary looking for those words, and, and H, there, are just far more H words like that than any other letter. Um, and it could be that just sort of if you're trying to come up with a silly word for something, you yeah, know, and yeah. hocus pocus, and you just sort of start out by breathing. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you're going, hum, <laughs> hum, de dumpty. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we leave, <clears throat> well, before we leave H, let's talk about humor, which is something close to your heart, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's a word or there's a phrase, dry humor. Which you say is ironic, because humor what? Is? Humor comes, the root of humor is like the root of humid. It comes from uh, liquid moisture. Uh, so, sort of an oxymoron, that dry humor. You know, pe people used to believe that there were several humors in the body. There was bile and uh, phlegm and blood and uh, I don't know the others. Four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Yeah, that's right, two different biles, I forgot. <laughs> Uh, that that ruled you know that ruled the body and uh, ruled human behavior I guess so if you were phlegmatic you were a certain type of per type of person if you were bilious you were a certain type of per person um, and if you were bloody you had just been in a fight I guess I don't know <laughs> but at any rate they were they were all liquids you know and so it's a fluid it's a, it, so right here. well. Do you think there are good letters and bad letters? Um, surveys indicate that letters A, <laughs> B, S, and M produce the most favorable feelings yeah, apparently, in people. Yeah. That, I read that somewhere. I don't know if that's true. You should just go around saying A, S, you know, just say, <laughs> saying same to everybody or something. I don't know. Yeah, what are the bad ones? The bad ones, the Q, Q, X, yeah. Z, F, as in Frank, and U. Yeah. <laughs> Evoke the worst yeah. feelings. Right. So that uh, you can probably think in your head Q some words that do. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> All right, well, maybe we better go back to the alphabet. Yeah. How, 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 how do you feel about N? Word, the word letter N? The letter N, yeah. Uh, I like it all right, but it's, it's sort of a negative, uh, it, it, you sort of. I don't know. It's, it, it, it's sort of negative. It starts a lot. Of, I think most languages, the word for no is, does start with N. So, yeah, not so. It do, N does, have a, I don't know. It, it yeah. does have a negative um, yeah, resonance. Yeah, so yeah. for instance. Na, na. Na, 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 na. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. What about T? Frequently, T evokes disapproval. Um, hmm. Why? I wonder why that is. Tisk, tisk, tisk. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I just a lot of you know trouble and uh, I don't know forgotten. But but T also is a uh, big a word on the that ends in T tends to be like dot and spot and and you know T is just it's not you know a W is woo so, you know but T just stops you know right on the dot. Um, uh, 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 
pity pat. I don't know. So, you know, a pat answer. I don't know. There's something about the T that just sort of cuts things off and stops them. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think the T should be the last letter in the alphabet for that reason. Well, well, it used to be the last word or the last alphabet in the Jewish alphabet. Uh -huh, I think so. And but, maybe the well, Greek. I think Greek. Yeah, uh, the Greek too. Well, well, why do you effort. think that they lost that position? I don't know. Maybe there was some uh, emperor who was named started with T. And he, uh, <laughs> he didn't like it way back there. They get, I would call in his uh, Fiddler's Three and said, make up four more letters and stick them after mine. <laughs> well, there's a word, T-M-E-S-I-S. -S. Ah, yeah. Tamesis, I guess. Tamesis. Tamesis is like absoblumenlutely. Absoblumenlutely. What? Absolutely, you know. Oh, absolutely, yeah. A, 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 a word in the, a it. word injected in the middle of another word, to give it right. more of, of an impact. Right, and but the, uh, ironically, the word tamesis is sort of jammed together. It yeah, seems yeah, seem like it's, it's the only word in English, I believe, that starts tm. You know, uh, you'd think it would be tweenamesis or something. You know, just sort of the opposite of what, of what it uh, sounds like. Well, if you've just joined us, I'm Valerie Jackson, and I'm going between the lines with Roy Blunt, Jr. at the Literary Center at the Margaret Mitchell House in Atlanta. Roy contends in Alphabet Juice that sound and the sense of a word are often related. Um, let's talk about W, the only English word whose name contains neither the letter itself nor any of the letters sounds. Right. So where did W come from? Um, well, it, it, it has a long history. I, I don't remember all of it, but the you know the French call it double V, and then and, uh, and it, in fact in print it is two V's. For a long time it was V's instead of U's, you know. And oh, yeah. it is. Too, I mean, yeah, double. Uh, I guess originally it was U's. The I used, don't remember. Yeah, yeah. the U's. Yeah, double U, double U. You know, if you're in script, it's two little U's, but in uh, Print, it's two V's, and the French call it double V. And uh, there, every letter has a long history that has to do with its uh, uh, legibility and readability. Like the letter I is probably the most interesting. I mean, the the first person singular in English and American is uh, capitalized, and I don't know any other language where it is. You know, ich, yeah. and uh, you know, um, and uh, the. Um, and maybe you know, that seems like maybe egotism on the part of Brits and Americans, but here's how it evolved at any rate. It used to be uh, ich in English. It was derived from ich, ich, you know, in German. It used to be ich, and uh, that's not very nice for a first-person name somehow. Ich, you know, if you're getting married and you say, will you take this lady to be your lawfully wedded wife, and you say, ich will, it's just not very good. <laughs> and then it went to itch. People started saying itch. And that's not too good either. Itch will, so, you know, seven-year itch is bad enough. But uh, and then people, there was at least in some dialects, uh, the ch moved over to the verb, and it, so you, people would say instead of I will, people would say chill. Well, there again, you say, well, you take this man to be your awfully married husband, and you say chill. It's not very good. <laughs> um, so finally, it just became I, and it was, a, but it was a little, little I. It was just Small one little case. mark, yeah, yeah, but with no dot. Hmm. So it got mixed, it would get mixed in with W's because you know when scribes were writing, they would make W's with three little lines, and M's with three little lines, and they'd be hasty, and, and an I next to it would just get lost. That's why oh. women is spelled W O M. It used to be W I, but you the I mixed in with the W and w M, is. so they made it an O, just so you could tell tell what it was. But um, then. Uh, like I say, it got mixed in with the other letters, so they put a dot over it. That's called a tittle. If you've heard of jots mm -hmm. and tittles, that's a tittle. Um, and that, but that still didn't work well enough. Maybe the tittle drifted. I don't know. But um, <laughs> but the uh, so they uh, capitalize it. So we have now a capital I, uh, big old looks like a Roman column I. Right. I hereby sort of thing. <laughs> instead of itch hereby. That, <clears throat> <clears throat> well, the last letter of the alphabet, Z, often not included in dictionaries in Shakespeare's time. Why, yeah. what, what happened I to the Z? A, there was a prejudice against Z. There, I don't know whether I can say this word. Um, it, it, it was a, I'm trying to think of a... Uh, well, anyway, I'll spell it out. Well, uh, one character in Shakespeare refers to, insults somebody. You know, Zed, British called Z, Zeds. 
and he accuses someone of being a W-H-O-R-E-S-O-N-Z, thou, thou Horson Z, thou useless letter, he says. And uh, it's, uh, so, and Z wasn't used a lot. In, in fact, let me think, it, it kind of crept, it, this is literally true, it came in on a zephyr into, uh, zephyr is a word uh, uh, in Greek, you know, it's a Greek word that came into Latin, and they couldn't spell it without a Z, so they had to add Z, so we have, <laughs> People like Zephyrus, and uh, so, you know, you couldn't call it an effort. So, uh, you know, a little fascinating stories about our letters. Um, well, if you had the power to change any letters in the English language, which ones would you change? Um, well, let me think. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, huh, I kind of like them the way they are. I, um, I find that bees... When you're signing your name, my last name starts with a B, it tends to get the two humps get lost. So maybe if, but you can't, it, I don't know how I would change it. Maybe if it had three humps, maybe <laughs> I find that when I'm signing books, the B tends to get sort of into a big old, turn into a, a perhaps appropriately, it turns into a blob. <laughs> is there a particular word that you dislike, or maybe one you're extra Oh, well, there are lots of, like the word, the uh, abbreviation, microphone. Microphone, abbreviation for microphone, spelled M-I-C, which is a very professional way to spell it, but I hate that, because M-I-C is Mick, right. not Mike. Right. Mike used to be spelled M-I-K-E, <coughs> and it's still spelled that way in Rolling Stone magazine, I noticed. Um, but, and it's, you know, you don't say, you don't spell bike, B-I-C, that's Mick. Right. And I just hate, you know, phonet my mother taught me to read phonetically, and which is tricky in English. It's not very consistent, but there still is a lot of phonetic value in, in letters. And to waste the perfectly phonetically spelled M-I-K-E and just turn it into Mick, you know, because, <laughs> because it's shorter or something. And it's, uh, it just oh, loses yeah. something. Yeah, I mean, it's a sound <laughs> thing, and microphones are all about sound. So spell the sound right. I don't know. You know, one of my pet peeves, and I, I read this in your, in, in your book, and I, I so want to share it because I literally wince. That's one of your words, mm. that you wince. Yeah, makes you wince. I, I wince each time I hear the phrase, very unique. Yeah, yeah. Let's <coughs> I'm sorry. share mm. what the rule is about the word unique. Yeah, unique means there's one of a kind. So you can't be very unique. Uh, you can't be sort of unique. You can't be uh, perfectly unique. Is uh, you know, it's unique. If something's unique, that's strong enough without putting an adjective next to it. Um, unique. It's a people use it a lot because it's snappy to say. I think. Unique. I, I, it's like chic or. You know, and, and unfortunately, most of the time when I hear the word unique, I hear very with it. Yeah, I know. It's it's, bec it's become very acceptable. Almost like um, same exact. No, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's another one that kind of yeah, bothers me. But exact. anyway, yeah. what about vowels, consonants, and and things like that? Uh, the yin and the yang of language, mm. so to speak. Yeah, I always I think of when I think of consonants, I think of my father down in the basement uh, in his little workshop, and he'd have a long uh, screwdriver or something, and he had all these little drawers full of uh, widgets and uh, b nuts and bolts and wing nuts and things, and he'd be going through those with his with it, humming a sort of uh, tuneless hum and, and just happy as he could be down there, uh, making little clicky, hard noises with his, uh, with his screwdriver. And, uh, but vowels, I think of my mother going, ah, and, uh, and, <laughs> oh, and then she would cook and we would go, hmm. <laughs> In your book, you say vowels are the melody and consonants mm. are the, uh, the rhythm sections. Oh, yeah, yeah, rhythm sections, right, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. What about punctuation? What's your relationship with commas? I like, I like, I use, I like to use, I mean, I know there are rules, and I, and I like the rules, but mainly I use them uh, rhythmically, you know, to, I mean, I hear a comma, mm -hmm. not the, like that, but there's, uh, <laughs> Victor Borger used to do punctuation, audible punctuation, but, uh, I mean, I hear it as a certain pause, and a semicolon is a different kind of pause. It's like, and, and a colon is like, ta da, sort of, you know. And uh, I give you, you know. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I think that uh, if you if you have a sense of how they sound and how people have used them and how you've read them, then you don't have to 
worry about the uh, rules so much. The uh, hyphen is supposed to cause more trouble than any other form of yeah. punctuation. Well, maybe with the exception of the comma. So, yeah. yeah, hyphens, I'm trying to think of an example of a, a bad hyphen. Uh, people tend to just, anything like, uh, maybe you got one there from the book, I don't know. Uh, let's see. But people tend to just, anything they're afraid might not be understood, they just ram it all together with hyphens, you know, and say, uh, you say, uh, he, he weighs 120 pounds. So people will say 120 hyphen pounds. You know, they don't need that. Uh, if it's a 120 pound bass or something, it's then that's hyphenated because it, you can because you need to hyphenate it to, because it goes together as a clump. But to say that bass must weigh 120 pounds is not that's different. There's no reason to hyphenate that. And I think if you can hear a hyphen, it's sort of you can hear things when they're jammed together, like a. Uh, a none too early arrival, you know, as opposed to he arose none too early. You know, it's a, it means a none too, you say with your voice holding it all right. together to make it clear it's one word. You, I mentioned earlier in the introduction the um, NPR show, Wait, Wait, uh, Don't Tell Me. Um, what's the biggest difference between doing something like that uh, orally and writing a column or a book? Um, the great thing about writing is also the terrible thing about it, which is you can keep changing it. You know, so it it's never seems quite finished. You know, you have to you think, oh, wait a minute, let me, let me sit there. That's not right. Uh, uh, and just sort of, you know, sanding back and forth over it. And then you catch a splinter, and you think, oh, no, okay. You're running it back and forth through your head, and that, that's not quite right, you know. Whereas if you say something, you just say it. You know, and then, it's, uh, it's done, and right? It goes out over the ether. And, uh, can't get it back. Sometimes the problem, but there's a word in your book, jibble. That jibble, you said, yeah. yeah you, that, that came from your mother. You but, said it should be in the dictionary. And yeah. Your mother should be credited. Well, yeah. What, what does it, jibble mean? It came from giblet. You know, it's just uh, now you have jibbled up that paper all over the floor. I've got to jibble up that styrofoam. You know, little kid. Uh, it, jiblet is a cut thing that's cut up. And she said, I'll just jibble up some, uh, uh, some jibble up some. Uh, some carrots here or something, you know, she just chop things up and they'd be jibbling it up. Because it comes back, it's a back formation from giblet, as in giblet gravy, which uh, come, I, I, I've forgotten the, the true derivation of giblet, but it's in the book. Well, I mentioned earlier also the sound um, of, of the words in your subtitle, for instance. And you said in the book that if you read only visually and cerebrally, it's like eating just for the vitamins. That's right, yeah. Yeah, there's so much flavor in music in language that uh, if you say that it's all arbitrary, then you miss all of that. So, well, the book, da. the book is absolutely fascinating. It goes into words that might uh, uh, initiate certain colors in your mind. Mm. I mean, there's so much yeah. that, that we could go into. Yeah, there's so many. My sister has synesthesia, which is uh, she sees let numbers as colors. She'll see... Um, She'll say, oh, that, tele that telephone number clashes. I hate that telephone number. Cause it's, <laughs> but I don't have anything like that. But various writers have seen letters. Nabokov saw letters as colors. He told his mother, that alphabet block is the wrong color, obviously. And she, she went along with him that's on it. And that's probably why he's a writer, was a writer. Well, it's a fascinating book, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We've been talking about Alphabet Juice by Roy Blunt, Jr., Thank you so much, Roy, for being with us tonight, and a special thanks to the Literary Center at the Margaret Mitchell House. Until next time, I'm Valerie Jackson, reminding you that there's always more to learn when you go between the lines. Thank you, Valerie. All right. I think we're going to open the floor up for questions. Uh, all right. Uh, if you'll stand and, and, and give me your question, and I'll repeat it. My question is just, I don't know whether it's in the book or not, because I wrote a book, but to be perfectly honest, I think that a lot. To be perfect, I'm sorry. To be perfectly honest. To, that, that phrase, to be perfectly honest. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think anybody ever is perfectly honest, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of verbiage, isn't it? You know, really nasty.
couldn't really add anything to put perfectly in there. Because yeah. <laughs> nobody's thing, perfect, right? <laughs> well, one thing, why should you, you should be honest without saying you're being honest? All right, from now on, I'm being honest. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, why isn't palindrome a palindrome? <laughs> <laughs> why isn't palindrome a palindrome? Palindrome a palindrome. That's one that just slipped through. I don't think. I love palindromes. Um, Abel was I ere I saw Elba. Was one of the <laughs> but Napoleon said. Um, I, well, you got me there. I, I don't know where palindrome, you know the derivation of palindrome? Maybe I have it in here. I'll look. See. <laughs> I'll look it up I in the book. I don't remember here. reading that one. I don't remember reading that Any other questions? While I'll be looking searching? something up, man. Okay. <laughs> I once wrote something where a southern narrator said he was fixing breakfast and I squoze some oranges. Squoze, yeah. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, <they're not. laughs> um, yeah, I think squoze is a lot more sonic than squeezed. But, um, but squeeze is pretty good, actually. But, yeah, squoze I think is good. And I also, here's a lot of people turn up their noses and say, how about snuck? You know, the S-N word. I like snuck, frankly. I, I mean, As opposed to sneak. 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 Okay. He snuck up on somebody. Yeah. Sneak this person. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, for a moment I thought you were going to say he was fixing to cook breakfast. Yeah, fixing. <laughs> fixing. Where did that come from? You know where that came from? Fixing? I don't I'm know. Fixing where, yeah, I don't, said it all my life, yeah. but I don't know where it comes from. I, I think it's like getting ready. Well, obviously it means I'm getting fixing. ready. To, I'm fixing. But, you know, I'm fixing up. I don't know. It sort of makes sense. I'm Do you fix something? Fix, yeah. Okay. I don't know. But Any more questions? In the back, in the uh, black in the back? <laughs> <laughs> what is your opinion of the addition of the word soccer mom? <laughs> well, is your mom a soccer mom? I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to say. Uh, well, I don't know. And they, you know, they come up with these terms like Joe Six Pack and soccer would that, mom. Would, those, would they be hyphenated? Those words? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Unless you use it as an adjective, you say the soccer mom vote, then you would oh, okay. hyphenate it. But okay. soccer mom, okay. No, okay. I wouldn't hyphenate that. Um, yeah, it's that's uh, all these generalizations and categorizing people uh, bothers me. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you think America may have a problem with less view mm. than yeah. Europe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. America, does America have a problem with less and few? <laughs> the American and people. Lay? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. A lot of people have. Uh, I don't. You know, I just. I always say less for uh, like less soap using less soap and fewer for, you know, fi yeah, finding fewer, fewer people looking through the window. I just, I just have to, you know, if they're discrete uh, units, you use fewer, and if it's a sort of a mass of something, you use less. Uh, I, and it sounds better that way to me, but if you said less people are voting this year than did last year, it just bothers me, but uh, it's very common, and I don't think you can go to jail for it. What about lie and lay? Lie and lie, too, yeah. I once corrected my own mother. And she said, uh, you know, I didn't correct, she just said, you know, she used to say, lay that on the table, which is, you know, oh, no, that's right, lay that on the table. She used to say, uh, I'm just going to lay down for a while. And uh, I didn't tell her it was wrong, but one time she insisted that it was right, and I said, I'm sorry. She was talking to my sister, I think. And she said, Excuse me, I'm sorry. But, it's lie down and it's lay something down. And then I walked off and uh, my mother never spoke to me again. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question in the back here, young gentleman. Are you going to put Joe the plumber in the next <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe the plumber. I, I think Joe he goes with soccer mom, right? <laughs> Joe the plumber has been in enough things already. <laughs> young lady beside him. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, famously, I don't know whether you ever said it or not, but uh, Churchill, uh, somebody went through something he wrote and corrected it by taking all the prepositions, uh, you know, off, off the, the ends of things. And, and he said, and he 
said, you can't change my stuff like this. He supposedly said, this is something up with which I will not put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and, he said, and I split, and split infinitives are, that's just a school marmish, uh, that's kind of a sexist term, I guess, but, uh, you know, just a sort of fussy uh, thing. Uh, lots of times to split the, to, to uh, precisely split the infinitive is, uh, you know, to expressively, I don't know. Is, uh, is there's nothing wrong with it because it's the best way to do it, to, to say what you want, to, to uh, you know, adequately say what you want. <laughs> so I found a palindrome here. Under palindrome, ah. I, I, I didn't, didn't say what the root, roots of the word is, but I was in a village along the river Wayaga in Peru, and I shared a mango with a local boy. Yum, I said to him. Bui yum, he replied. <laughs> <laughs> Spontaneous palindrome. All right. I think we might. One more in the back. Yes. How do you like like? How do I like like? Well, I find myself saying uh, I've been traveling now for like uh, <laughs> two weeks. Um, you know, and that, I, I say it myself. Not, but, you know, but when people say, uh, you know, so I was like, you know, or, or I, you know, I was like, I was like, I'm not going with him anymore, and and, and, and he's like, and she's like, well, I'm going to go with him anymore, and, and I'm like, no, you are not either. <laughs> I, I don't care much for that, but uh, hey. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you want me to? Go ahead, sure. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully mm. and. Virtually. Yeah, I think they're both weasel words, you know. <laughs> vir I vir virtually came to a standstill, you know. I mean, just go ahead, I came to a standstill, you know. Uh, and hopefully uh, is a big argument. And I just don't like when when um, L.L. Bean says, hopefully your package will be delivered by Christmas. <laughs> I mean, is, is that they are hoping or I'm hoping, you know. I want to know who's hoping. Uh, you know, if you say, I hope it, we hope it will be there, at least you're dealing with somebody, you know. I don't like hopefully, but that, a lot of people do, so. And virtually? And virtually, I, yeah, I think that's just sort of, you know, it's like, you know, I'm just, it's, it's kind of a hedge, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm virtually happy this morning, you know. What, I, I have an additional question. What yeah. about the rise and fall of the F word? What about, has it fallen? No. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I've been, but, in, the, I've been it, in a car all day. I, I didn't hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That, that was, <laughs> a news reporter, I forget his name, some news reporter just oh, said right. it yeah, on Joe air by said mistake uh, yeah. yesterday, a few days ago. Um, he did indeed. That is funny. He was saying, did I say, I didn't, I said the letter, did not, I didn't say the word. I was saying, my wife is going to kill me. I didn't. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe it will creep into, I don't know, I wrote the uh, introduction to a book called The F Word, which is just a list of all the different usages of it. And uh, it, well, I'll tell you, you know, it was in the Supreme Court the other day. They were talking about, uh, I think it was whether it should be banned from the radio or something. And, uh, and uh, Scalia, first of all, Roberts said, um, the, obviously the reason it's uh, offensive is because it's connected to sexual activity, right. which is ridiculous. Sexual activity is... You can say sexual activity on the radio. That's connected to sexual activity. Good point. Good point. The, the f the f word is um, is is so rude. I think it's the sound of the word. In fact, and then let me see if I remember this exactly. It's sonicy, huh? Sonicy, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I did a whole lot of sonicy uh, analysis of it in that introduction. But um, the um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, Scalia said yes. That's cause we. That's why golly waddles isn't offensive. You know. Golly waddles. I mean, that's no, that's the worst cuss word I ever heard. You <laughs> so golly waddling lame, I can't imagine. Yes, sir. How true is it that you allow yourself to tie an email just, you know, without capitalization, without punctuation? The uh, question is, do I allow myself to type emails without capitalization punctuation? No, I don't. I like to write it the way I'm. I'm really bad at uh, instant messaging because I'm always going back and fixing things. And then, you know, <laughs> about 
12 messages, I mean, whoever I'm corresponding with is about eight messages ahead of me. But I don't like to leave things messy, you know what I mean? My office is messy, but I don't like to, messy on the page bothers me, well, on the screen. Speaking of emails, you, you had a discussion there about the hyphen mm. in the word email, and I, I confess that I, out of laziness, had started dropping the hyphen in email, but now I stand corrected, no, and glad. I will put my yeah. hyphen back in email. <laughs> right. If I have saved one person from that. <laughs> you, all right, back here, one more, and then, okay, another question here? And then maybe two more after that. All right. To buttle? I don't know, yeah, as in the now being butler, yeah. Carry food to the table. Oh, to butler. To, bu to buttle, yeah. Oh, to buttle, okay. Butler's bottle, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It may, it's possible that people have used it that way. I, it seems to me I've heard people use it that way, but it's very, very obscure. It, anybody ever heard it used that way? I don't know what. P.G. Woodhouse. P.G. to use it? Yeah. Oh, really? To buttle. To buttle. Then there's rebuttal, too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then you rebuttal, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, P.G. Woodhouse is a wonderful writer. Over here? Uh -huh. We've got two over here, okay. There, there's a, we were supposed and to get back, somebody from oh, back there. Oh, that's right. So, okay, right. we'll get you right after this one here, okay. The question is, uh, is wait, wait, scripted, wait, wait, don't tell me scripted, or is it, are the remarks spontaneous? The, they tell us the night before what the theme of the fake news story is, you know, so you have overnight, to, I usually write it on the plane flying out there. Um, and just before we go on stage to, for the taping, they tell us what the theme of the prediction is going to be, you know, what's, what's the question is. We predict. But everything else is off, is just off the top of one's head. And it's fun. I like, we <clears throat> we all love doing doing that. It's so much. It's like it's, am I about to use like wrong? It's like it, it's as <laughs> <laughs> that's the trouble I've been having all night. Like <laughs> yeah, as we were saying earlier, you can um, <laughs> you know talk, talking. You just say something, and you know, and you don't have to go back and fix it. And uh, uh, except Peter has to go. Now, Peter and, and Carl have a script. Now, Peter ad-libs too, but uh, they have, you know, that's the structure of the show, asking the questions and everything. That's the script. Uh, Carl uh, is the rock upon which the show is built. Uh, All right. You, we, I'm sorry. sorry. We're going to take one from the back here, and then we'll come in and, and have you as our last one. All right? Oh, oh my God. Yeah. What do you think oh, of the yeah. common use of the word whatever? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a cop out. Whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that's that's not trying very hard to pin things down, is it? I mean, uh, and yeah, it bothers me. Whatever. Whatever. But, but, but I mean, why do? You, uh, it's well. I don't know. I'm trying to think why people like to say that so much. I guess just so they, huh? Yeah. It's what? It's easy. Easy say. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But, it's not much fun to say. It's not like, you know what I love to say? I love to say polyurethane foam. <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah. I, I can see why you would like to say yeah. that. It's like, it's like wa watching wa otters play in the water. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up with that. Oh, okay. Is there one more question? Well, I'll take, we'll take two quick ones, okay? Right. Okay. How do you stop people from saying, I feel bad? <laughs> yeah, you stop that's what you call hypercorrection, when you think you're doing the, <coughs> doing the correct thing. And in fact, you're, the simple uh, thing is, is, is the correct thing. Yeah, I feel badly means that my fingertips are all messed up and I can't, <coughs> can't feel anything. <coughs> and it's so prissy, too. I feel badly. Um, <laughs> I feel bad, as a matter of fact, right? I got a cold. I feel bad. I feel good. You wouldn't say I feel well. Well, you feel well, that means you feel healthy. But uh, I feel good. There's nothing wrong with that, my goodness. All right, one last one here. I was wondering if you would comment on how much critical mass is necessary for a word to get entered into a dictionary because you might 
Yeah, do do yeah, yeah, bad too. Yeah, but do I've got do, a long thing about do in here. The whole history of do I've got do mail. Yeah, man, I like man too. It's it's like yeah, it's man, and it's it's. How do you per- spell? How do you spell man? Yeah, it's M-E-H. like yeah, that man, oh, it's I sort of like blah. On the other hand, fe is different. It's, it's like fe um, is yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Some, yuck, kidding. I think, is a very. Sorry. Oh, I've got a lot of theory. You know, the theory is about the sound, the consonant sound of Y. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I won't go into it here, but it's in here. What were we? What? Oh, I don't know how words get. A di- I'm, it depends on the dictionary, obviously. But but dictionaries are more and more not going to be in books because the language expands so far fast, and it's on, you know, online is perfect for for dictionaries, unfortunately. What, what did you just say that dictionaries are going to? I think, well, for instance, the OED probably will never be published as a book again. What? Because it's just too, you know, books are, things in print are always already wrong. You know? Isn't that terrible? I mean, I love print. I live in print. But yeah, uh, yeah. and they also last a long time. And, they, you know, they have lots of virtues. But if it's factual, it's, you know, you can't keep a book up to date. This book has had me to go back and look through a dictionary that I have, a Webster's Dictionary that was published in 1923. Mm. Uh, the words were from the turn of the century, you know, uh, the words that I included. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very anxious, having read this now, to go back mm. and to look at some of the words in that yeah. almost, you know, 85, 90-year-old dictionary. I think I have that same dictionary, maybe. It's made of Indian paper. Yeah, Indian, 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 Indian. Yeah, I love that old dictionary. Yeah, me too. There are things in there, yeah, it, it, there, are things in there that yeah. they, people have stopped defining, but that yeah. they're still not dead yet. No, I can. Yeah. In fact, I got something out of here, in here about the word, oh, uh, the, oh God, the word tally. Tally, tally right, yeah. right, right, right. Well, I got not tally whacker. I did. That's how I got into it. <laughs> that's how I got into it. I couldn't find that. Yeah. It's what uh, our family doctor, we didn't have the same family doctor, I mean, my family doctor, um, referred to the penis as the telework, which I think it is. I always liked that. I never, nobody else did. What, what is that? And there was also, tell the story about, um, there's another, uh, there's a situation where you, um, I can't describe it. Uh, but it's 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 where. Uh, mm. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it, was, it was not suggested by a tally no. <laughs> no, but it was kind of in that same thing when it was the guy when the guy looked up and said. Um, uh, something, something goes up and down my spine. Oh, you know, oh, you, you yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You know well, what I'm talking well, about? about that one. What yeah. was that? <laughs> 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 oh, maybe. Oh, you Bert. know what it really was. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> Bert. <laughs> Bert, Bert Bernstein is a writer at the New Yorker, he was, and his brother was Leonard Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein always was better than him and everything, you know, and, and the people in New Yorker started uh, playing a game where you would change a title of something by... Uh, by rearranging the letters in one of the words, like you change the doors of perception, which is all this Huxley, I think. The doors of perception you change to the odors of perception. Yeah, so you change the word door to odor and to, okay, oops, go ahead. And so Bert was really good at this, apparently, and he ran ran over to Leonard and said, I got this great new game. Uh, You change the, um, you know, you change, you get a new title to a well-known title by just changing the letters and in one word, and Leonard was composing a, son- a sonata or something, I don't know, and he didn't even look up. He just said, I see fingers up and down my penis. <laughs> penis was fine originally. You know, I see fingers up and down my penis. I think we'll end on this note. <laughs> Thank you.